All right, Genesis chapter 4. It's kind of a long chapter, but there's a lot of reiteration going on. It's focused around these dreams that Pharaoh has. We're going to get into this. I'm probably not going to go through verse by verse every single verse like I normally do just because of the reiteration. But let's, um, let's go through here. Basically, I'm, we're going to skip ahead. The first, um, like the first eight verses tells us the dream that Pharaoh has. And then... When Pharaoh recounts the dream to Joseph, he adds a little bit more detail. So we're just going to kind of skip over. We already read these verses, obviously, at the beginning. So I'm going to skip passages for the sake of time to get through this. Let's start reading here in verse number 9. It says, Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in ward and the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker, and we dreamed a dream in one night. I and he, we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man in Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams, to each man according to his dream, and he did interpret. So the butler remembers now. What, it, this, was, this is going back just one chapter. Last week we went through chapter 40. And chapter 40, is the entire chapter is dedicated to the dreams that the butler and the baker both had and how Joseph interpreted those dreams, how the butler was going to be restored his position of butlership again, and the baker was going to be put to death. And those, that's what Joseph said. He interpreted the dreams unto him, and that's exactly what happened. And I went over last week how that you know, interpretation of these dreams comes from God. Joseph gave credit unto God, saying, you know what, it's not my own wisdom, it's not my knowledge that's able to, to tell you what these dreams mean. It's because the interpretation comes from God. Daniel says the same exact thing, and we went over that last week, so I'm not going to get too much into that at all this week. Um, even though we're seeing the same things happening, Pharaoh goes to the wise men, you know, to the astrologers, the magicians, all these you know, false prophets, all the, the world's wisdom, the world's way of thinking about things, the, the sorcery and, and everything else that's out there, but they've got no answers. Just like today, if you want real truth, if you want, if you want to have real understanding in any mystery, in anything that's confusing unto you, in this case it's a dream, but if you want the solid truth, you have to go to the Lord. You have to go to God for that. And Joseph here is just a messenger of the Lord. He's just someone that can help you to understand what God's trying to say. He says, the interpretation comes from God. I'm not some special person. I'm not above anyone else as far as just, you know, it's because I'm so wise and learned. He said, no, the interpretation comes from God. But remember last week, before, you know, the butler was about to get released uh, according to his dream and according, according to the interpretation there. So Joseph's like, hey, when you leave, don't forget about me. He says, I've been falsely imprisoned. I was sold into slavery by my family. And even here, the, where I am in prison, I did, it's the, because I didn't do anything wrong, he says, I was falsely accused even being thrown into the dungeon. I don't belong here. Remember me when it comes well with you and you go back unto Pharaoh. Remember me and speak well of me. But of course, the butler forgets. But now, Pharaoh's having all of these dreams. And it's, it's been two years. And the first verse says it's been two years after, after the butler was, was released from prison. Two years go by. Pharaoh's talking about these dreams. Now he's trying to have people come in and no one's able to interpret it for him. And then the butler's like, oh, man, that's right. Yes, you know what? There is someone that can interpret dreams. And I totally forgot. And that's why he says, you know, I remember um, my faults this day. I should have said something about this before. But he said, you know, there's this Hebrew. He's locked up in prison. And, and he tells him the story, you know, we both had these dreams and he interpreted them to us and, and everything came to pass exactly as he said. So it says uh, in verse 13, and it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was me he restored in mine office and him he hanged. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. So now Pharaoh wants Joseph here because he really wants to know what these dreams mean. They've been bothering him. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. Now, this is kind of interesting. I'm going to take a little bit of time to, to go in this point. Not too much time, but it's, a, it's interesting here. It says that he shaved himself. Now, what he's doing, obviously, he's cleaning himself up, first of all. You know, he changed his clothing. He's going before Pharaoh. It's an important deal. But one of the things that's different with the Egyptians, because he's in Egypt, they have different customs than the Hebrews do. The Hebrews, all throughout the Bible, you'll find men with beards. That, that was very much a part of their culture. And um, here he shaves himself to go before Pharaoh. The, the Egyptians didn't have that same, that same um, 
you know, the aspect of their culture where the men all had beards. They shaved, he shaved himself. Now, people ask me, because you know, if you notice, I've grown my beard out quite a bit, and people ask me questions, oh, why do you have the beard so long and everything else? Now, I, I'm going to start off right off the bat just being very, very clear here. I don't think it's a sin for men not to have beards. I don't think that God, because God has never once commanded anyone ever as a man that you have to have a beard. Okay, so I just want to make sure that I'm very clear on, on, on where I'm coming from with this statement and, and what I believe. But um, there is something about having, and, and you know, you could say this is just for the Hebrews, and that's fine. But what we find in Scripture, in, uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 10, there is a, there's a story here where David was, um, he was trying to do well to another, another ruler's um, son. He found out that there was, I forget what it was, someone, you know, someone was sick, and he sends his messengers to basically to comfort him and say, you know, okay, um, you know, just, just, we're sorry this is happening or whatever. And the, the, the servants that go into that land were treated real bad because the, the king's uh, counselors were saying, you know what, he's not coming here because he cares about you. He's coming here to spy out the land and he's really secretly going to invade you. So what they do is they mishandle his servants in uh, verse 4. You don't have to turn I'll read this verse. It's two verses in 2 Samuel 10, verses 4 and 5 read, Wherefore Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. So basically they're mocking him, they're ridiculing him. You know, they, 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 they shave off half of their beards and cut half of their garment, you know, cut them in half, and then send them away. Now, it's obviously a very shameful thing that they do that. They're, they're just, they're, they're mocking him, they're ridiculing him, and that's what they do, and they send him off. But then what, what, what I always found a little bit interesting is that in verse 5, it says, When they told it unto David, he sent to meet them, because the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. They, he didn't say, like, well, just shave off the other half and then come back. He says, wait, you know, just wait there, wait until your beard comes back. And then, and then come back into Israel. And, um, you know, that, again, it speaks a little bit to their culture, but I, I'm not saying this is a command of God that you have to have a beard. But I do believe this, that God did make men and women different, obviously. There's a distinction between the sexes, and He wants us to be different. He wants us to dress different. He wants our hair even to be different, as you'll find in 1 Corinthians. You say it's, it talks about women are supposed to have long hair. It's a glory to them, and men should have short hair. It's a shame for a man to have long hair. Well, the way that I look at it is God obviously created men to grow hair on their face. I mean, it's, it, it, it happens. It's natural. It's, what, it's the way that he designed us. And I figure if he designed us this way, then why would I want to just get rid of it all? And that's the way, you know, because I've had people ask, and I, it's not a big deal. Like, I don't have, I'm not stuck on my looks and my appearance, other people. I don't really care. But it's just something that I came to. At first, at first I was growing a beard because I hated shaving anyways. Because it's just, you can say it a little bit louder, amen, that's fine, I, I, I hear that. <laughs> because it's kind of a pain, right? And it's expensive to buy all those razors and stuff, and it's just like, you know what? I'm sick of this. I, I, I'm, I don't want to deal with this. But then after a while, I was thinking about more, you know what? God made me with, to, to grow hair on my face. Why am I getting rid of it all the time? I'm just going to let it go. No, do what you want to do. Again, I, I don't think you're insane if you shave or anything. I don't think that for one second. I don't think there's a problem with it. I just look at it as a fact of it's one more distinguishing feature that God has created between men and women, so why shave? So why get rid of it? And, and that's the kind of the point where I come from. And then when you look at God's chosen people, that it was a part of their culture. I think it was a part of their culture for a good reason. I mean, Egypt is viewed at, as, as heathen and as the world. In the Bible, that's, that's a very common theme. And Israel... Is, is looked on as God's chosen people and, and people who should be doing the right thing. Um, I've got, there's multiple references to this. There's one reference, I didn't, I didn't put it down here, but Aaron, it talks about his beard and the oil going and, and reaching all the way down to his toes. And it, it sounds like it's his beard goes down to his toes, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. So I didn't include it. I don't want to be preaching something that's just inaccurate. But um, also in Jeremiah 48, we see... Um, when people's beards are, are being clipped or trimmed or shaven, it's, it's something that's done in like sorrow and grieving. And in Jeremiah 48, verse 36, the Bible reads, Therefore mine heart shall sound for Moab like pipes, 
and mine heart shall sound like pipes for the men of Kirhiriz, because the riches that he hath gotten are perished. So he's talking about the city of Kirhiriz, and the riches are perished. You know, they've gone into poverty. And then it says in verse 37, For every head shall be bald, and every beard clipped. Upon all the hands shall be cuttings, and upon the loins sackcloth. So it, it's, he's describing all these things, baldness of the head, beard being clipped, cuttings in the hands, and, and wearing sackcloth are all things that are done when people are grieving, when they're real upset and real sorrowful. It's something that's done in that type of a time. We saw the, people, the men, uh, David's men were ashamed when they had half their beards shaved off and, um, and these things. So there's, there's a few things. You know, those are the reasons. I just kind of wanted to answer that uh, you know, the, when people look at me like, you know, why is the beard growing so long? But I will say this. My beard has turned into an ev evangelical tool. <laughs> I was out soul winning a few weeks ago, and I was, I was on one side of the street, and there's there another group on the other side of the street. And I saw a guy who was standing in his driveway, but I didn't approach him because the other guys were coming up real close anyway. So I was like, oh, I'll let them talk to him. And as I was walking, you know, he stopped me. He says, he says, hey, man, how did you get your beard to grow so long? So I was like, sweet, you know, it's great the opportunity, you know, because you always love those opportunities, when so, especially when someone approaches you. Hey, you start talking to me, guess what? I'm going to be giving you the gospel. because <laughs> You start talking to me about stuff, that's fair game. And not that I wouldn't, I, I would have normally approached him anyways, but like I said, there's another group coming up. But to me, I was like, after that conversation, I was just like, cool, you know, hey, at least now I could say that there's, there's another legitimate reason for having a beard because I had someone actually stop me and ask me about it and then I, could, uh, I had an opportunity to, to preach the gospel unto him. Uh, obviously, I'm kind of joking about that, but it was, uh, that was a real story though. So, like I said, you know, I, I don't want to go too far on that point. We need to, we, there's a lot more in this chapter, but when it said that Joseph shaved himself, you know, he was doing that. And again, Joseph is looked at as a man who was very righteous. He was right with God and God was with him. So if Joseph's shaving his beard off, you know, I doubt that, you know, it's not a sin to shave your beard. And again, it's not a sin because the Bible never says it is. But just one more example, you know, if you, you may work for a place and your boss might want you to be clean shaven. So like if you're a Christian man, just be like, well, I can't do that. To get, no, you know, I don't think there's any problem with that. If it's going to please your boss, then fine, whatever. Like, if there was something that my boss really wanted me to do and I wanted to keep that job, I, I would just be like, fine, whatever, I'll shave. That's, that's, that's the way that I would deal with it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, and we see here Joseph doing the same thing. Uh, we, we saw, you know, and you can't just say, well, um, it's because he was a slave or something. Well, look at Daniel. When Daniel was, was given, you know, wine and the, and the meat to eat that was offered on idols, he refused them. And he did it tactfully, but he, he refused them, even though he was brought a slave, basically, when they were brought captive. It's the same situation. Joseph and Daniel are very similar characters in, in, many, in many regards in the Bible. But um, I, I firmly believe that, that if it was a sin to shave, you know, Joseph wouldn't have done it. But here we see he does shave. He goes and, and he's like, OK, I'm going to clean myself up. I'm going to look good for Pharaoh. And um, he goes before Pharaoh. So let's continue on here. Verse number 15, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I've heard say of thee that thou canst understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So we see there again, Joseph's giving all the credit to God, as he did with the, with the butler and the baker in the previous chapter. He says, It's not me, it's God. Verse 17, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, in my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven kine. A kine, a kine is just the plural for cow. It's just there's, there's all these cows, basically, it's these kine um, on the river, fat-fleshed and well-favored, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them, poor and very ill-favored and lean-fleshed, such as I never saw in all, of the, in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and the ill-favored kind did eat up the first seven fat kind, and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them, but they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I awoke. So his first dream, he's got these real nice, big, fat cows that are, that are come up out of the river, and they're grazing in the meadow, and they're eating, and they're nice and big and fat flesh. And then he says, after that, another seven cows come up out of the river, 
but they're real skinny and decrepit looking and just and just emaciated and they come and they eat the other fat cows but you would think after eating these other fat cows that they would be big and full now and he says no they're still just as emaciated they're still extremely bad he's like i've never seen cows look this bad before ever in all the land of egypt look that decrepit and that and that sick and that ill this is the dream that he had. And then he has a second dream where it's the, it's the stalks, it's, it's the corn, right? So he's got one stalk comes up and he's seven nice, big, juicy, fat ears of corn grow on it. And then another one comes up after it and it's, it's the same thing. It's these withered, shriveled, you know, it's the east wind blasted on it and this corn that's just, that's just not juicy at all, real dry, come up after it and, and it's the same thing. They consume the good ears and... Um, He's basically, these are the dreams that he has. And um, he, he says here in verse number 24, And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. So now Joseph explains that they're two separate dreams, but they're both about the same exact thing. He says that, that you know, the, the two dreams that you're having are both regarding the same event and that God is showing you what's going to happen. God's actually giving you, you know, a, a peek into the future. God's telling you what is going to pass here very shortly. And Joseph expounds the dream unto him. And he explains in verse 26, the seven good kind are seven years. And the seven good years are seven years. The dream is one. So he's saying, you know, the good, the good ones that came up, that's seven years. It's going to be seven years of plenty. It's going to be seven years of good times where things are real bountiful. Things are going great. You know, you're, you're, you're reaping good yields on your harvest. Everything's going good for seven years. But then after that, the, the, bat, the, the famine is going to come in seven years. And basically, the famine is going to be so bad that for as good as it was for those seven years, it's going to mean nothing when the famine hits. And you think now, you might be doing, you could think of years, maybe you've done well at your job and you've, you've been blessed and you have extra stuff coming in and you have extra goods. And then things might not go as well for a while, but you're still okay because you've been doing so well prior to that, right? That you could kind of ride it out a little bit longer just because things have been going so well. He says this famine is going to be so bad that it's going to be like you didn't even have those good years. It's going to be so bad that, that it'll be like nothing. And that's exactly what happens. But let's, let's keep going here. He explains, uh, let's jump, jump down a little bit. In verse 32, he says, And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will surely bring it to pass. So he, he said the reason why you dreamed the same thing basically twice is because God's basically, he set it in stone. It's established. This is going to happen. He's not changing his mind on this. This is going to happen, and he wants to make sure that you know this is happening for sure. That's why he gave, he, he dreamed two dreams. Verse 33, Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. And I, and I love how Joseph does this, because he just asked, Pharaoh just asked him for the interpretation of the dream. But now Joseph is offering up his advice as well. Uh, he didn't, you know, Pharaoh didn't ask for it, but he's offering it up to him and he's telling him what he needs to do. And it's great advice. Joseph's full of wisdom and knowledge here and, he, and he's given Pharaoh excellent advice. And he tells him, look out a man, discreet and wise, send him over the land of Egypt, verse 34. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years and let them gather all the food of those good years that come and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities and that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants and Pharaoh said unto his servants can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the spirit of God is and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now this is an incredible blessing of God unto Joseph. Joseph here was pulled out of the prison house just because he could interpret a dream. 
And when he interprets the dream unto Pharaoh, Pharaoh makes him the number one man. I mean, the number two man, but essentially he's running everything. He basically tells Joseph, you are going to be running the entire kingdom. The only way that I'm better than you or have more authority than you is just in name is because I'm the Pharaoh. It's because I am the ultimate in charge, but, but you are going to be running and responsible for everything. He says, I want you. You are so wise. And he, he knows he's already gone to his wisest men to try to get the interpretation of the dream. And when he hears it from Joseph, he's like, you know what? This is truth. This is right. This is going to happen. Joseph knows what he's talking about. And what we see here with Joseph, there's, there's so many things. But um, one of the amazing things is that what we see in Joseph just in his character is that he stays steadfast in the Lord in serving God and in doing what's right. He never gets the bad attitude. We never see that in scripture of him having this bad attitude. Joseph's been dealt a very bad hand, right? Joseph was a man. He was beloved of his father. Was that his fault? No. He was, I mean, he was, he was his dad's favorite. Jacob's favorite son was Joseph. And he did nice things for him and special things for him. And Joseph was a pretty righteous guy. He did that was right. He listened to his dad. He obeyed his dad and did what his dad told him to do. Now his brothers hated him. And they ended up wanting to kill him. And that's when they sold him into Egypt. And so he was sold as a slave. Here's, here's a good kid, right? He was 17 years old. He was sold into Egypt. Good kid, growing up, doing what's right. Next thing you know, something really bad happened. So he was sold as a slave. He sold into bondage, right? Right there is, a, is, a, is a, a, enough for some people to just say, oh, well, I was doing what's right, God. Now, why is this happening to me? And kind of throw up your hands and just say, forget God. I'm not going to do what's right anymore. I'm doing what's right and see what happens unto me. But no, that's very short-sightedness. We need to keep going. And, and that's not the end of it, though. You say, okay, well, yeah, he made it through that. So he's serving in this house, and he pretty quickly gets escalated to this position, essentially where he's at with Pharaoh, except underneath his master at that time, he rises up to where he's over the entire house of the person who bought him as his servant. And he's running the whole house of Potiphar. And then, next thing you know, he's doing his job, he's doing everything right. Potiphar's wife accuses him of, of trying to rape her, of trying to force her into bed. And then he gets thrown in a dungeon. And again, a false accusation, no, you know, no credibility whatsoever, completely false against Joseph, but Joseph is tossed in the dungeon. So first, he's, bought, he's sold into slavery, now he's in the dungeon for things that, that he didn't do. I mean, these are, these are events that happen to Joseph that are beyond his control, and it's just like, you know, God, what is going on here? I'm trying to do what's right, I'm trying to please you. But I love what the Bible says, that God is still, the whole way, God is with him. Because he's maintaining his integrity. He's not charging God falsely. He's not, he's not accusing God of, of being you know, mean or wrong or, or, or judging God in, in what he's going through. He's, he's doing the best that he can with where he's at. And even in prison, he, he gets to the point to where he's in charge of all the prisoners. God has escalated his position in there. Why? Because whatever position he's in, he's just trying to do his best at it. He's trying to live as righteously as possible in, in regardless of his scenario, regardless of his circumstances. That's what he's doing. And then, of course, the same thing happens. Now he's, he's released from prison, and then he ends up now in pretty much the highest position anyone could ever hope for because you can't hope to be Pharaoh. You know, the Pharaohs were... were um, I believe they were born into that position, but being over the entire kingdom of Egypt is pretty significant. So Joseph has been escalated to that position now and that um, he's in charge of everything. But I want to focus now for the majority of the time on this concept of how Joseph handles the coming threat, knowing that these bad times are going to come. His, his advice, his godly wisdom is to prepare for that and take up store. And he says to basically that they need to take up one-fifth. You know, his plan is to tax the people. In verse number 34, it says, Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. So he's taking 20%. 
everything, all the crop yields, everything that grows, we need to take 20% of that in the seven years that are, that are to come because we need to make sure that we're going to be able, we're going to have enough to make it through this, the years of famine, the seven years of famine. And this is what he, you know, he was saying is, is good to do. And this is very wise, sound advice to take. And say, hey, we need to lay up some stuff in store in order to get us through the hard times to come. Now, I was torn on this, on this subject a little bit a while ago, but not, not too torn on it. It's the subject of prepping. And being, you know, it's, it's gotten to be a real, a real popular thing, you know, and they, they, I guess they make these TV shows and all kinds of things, the doomsday preppers and all this other stuff. And there's a, there's a point to where I think it's absolutely ridiculous and, and you shouldn't be going too far with it, but there is definitely wisdom in prepping. Now, I don't think that Christians should be just planning, you know, having all these, these other locations set up and running to the hills and setting up your fortress and your compound and all this other stuff. I don't think we need to do that. I think we need to be ready to stay strong and to, and to preach the gospel and to do everything that we can for God up until the point where it says, you know, when, you know and it'll be known in Matthew 24, it says that, uh, you know, then shall they, you know, it, it's time to run into the mountains. And, and at that point, you're not even going back into your house to get anything. He's like, it's just time to go. And that, to me, is going to be, I read that, that's a very short period of time when it gets that absolutely bad where, like, you just have to, to flee for, for just not being put to death. Um, all throughout the Bible, we see people making stands. And it's a very biblical concept to make a stand and to just, to just stand for the truth, preach the, the truth about Christ. So with the prepping thing, you know, I don't think we need to get way, you know, build these underground bunkers and all this other stuff, which I admit they're kind of cool seeing that stuff, but it's, it's just a, I think it's just a big waste of time. And we don't need to do that. But there is wisdom in being prepared. And being prepared in general, first of all, just for bad times, you know, I, I think it's a good, I don't think it's something we should be focused on and, and, just, and just eating up all of our attention and saying, well, I need to make more money because I need to have all this food and guns and ammo and silver and gold and all this other stuff stocked up. And that, that consumes your time to where you're not doing what's right by God and by the Bible and, and just doing the things that you need to be, you know, righteous living. But if you do do those things, if you have the resources and you're able to put some stuff aside, I don't think there's anything wrong or sinful about that either. I think it's actually pretty wise to do. When you know that something is going to come ahead, hey, preparing for that time of, of hardship makes sense. And we know that we are going to be going through a time of tribulation. Well, we don't, we don't know that specifically that we will, but we know that there is a time of tribulation coming. We know that it's coming. We don't know exactly when it's going to come. So, but because we don't know exactly when it's going to come, and, we, and it very well could happen in our lifetimes, I don't think there's anything sinful or wrong about making sure, you know, you have a little bit of extra food because the Bible tells us that you're not going to be able to buy or sell when the Antichrist comes into power. So if you say, hey, I'm looking at this. This is from God's word. This is a warning. This is a message saying this is what's going to happen. Just as Pharaoh was warned, hey, there's seven years of famine coming ahead. You need to be prepared for this. Hey, there's going to be a time when you can't buy or sell. There's nothing wrong with being prepared for that time. I think that's perfectly good and wise to do something like that. I think it's wise to be able to have a little bit of uh, extra set aside. Now, here's why I was a little bit torn about this issue and the idea of, of kind of being prepped is because you always have to be able to reconcile passages in the Bible with each other. We need to understand what is it that God really wants us to do? What is it that makes sense? You could say, okay, well, yeah, for this time in Egypt, that's a very specific scenario. God specifically was telling him that this was going to happen in a dream. But God, but see, I also point out, God didn't say to stock up food for it. That was what Joseph said. But Joseph had some good godly wisdom to provide and that's how they got through those seven years of famine also is because of what Joseph did. It did carry them through and it was the right counsel to give. But it wasn't commanded of God to store up for it. God was just giving them the warning in those dreams. But let's look at, turn if you would to Luke chapter 10.
Luke chapter 10. I'm going to spend the majority of the sermon tonight just, just going into this concept of being prepared and prepping, especially for like the end times, right? The, wor the worst case scenario here that, that, that maybe the end times are coming real soon and we're going to have to go through that and being prepared for that. Look at verse number 2 of Luke 10. Well, let's just start reading verse number one just because we're there anyways. Verse number one, After these things the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. So this is when Jesus Christ, a little bit earlier on, Jesus Christ is sending out his, his disciples and sending them out to preach the gospel. And he's saying, you know what, the harvest is great. You know, labor is a few. Let, pray God that we can have more people doing this. But when he sends them out, he says, go your way. I send you forth as lambs among wolves. I'm sending you forth. You know, there's a lot of danger out there. There's wolves out there waiting to attack and you're like lambs and you're going out to do my work. There's a lot of people that are going to be waiting to pounce on you and attack you. But when Jesus was with them and he's sending them out, he says, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes. And so no matter, he's saying, don't, you know, basically you don't have to take anything with you because I'm with you and I'm telling you to do this. This was early on in his ministry. Now flip over to Luke 22. When Jesus was with them, he says, you don't need to bring money. You don't need to bring shoes. You, know, you will be completely taken care of. You are as lambs going amongst wolves, but I'm with you the whole way. Luke, number, Luke chapter 22, look at verse 35. Luke 22, 35 says, And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. So now he's bringing up what we just read. That's the reference we just read. When I sent you out and you didn't have any of that stuff, did you lack anything? Was there anything that you needed that you didn't have? And they're like, no. We were, we were absolutely fine. They listened as he commanded and they were just fine. Verse number 36, but look at what he says here. Then said he unto him, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. So now Jesus is saying something different. Right? First, he says, don't worry about any of that stuff. Just go out and do what I told you to do. You're going to be taken care of. He's saying, now though, you're going to need to take money with you. Hey, you're even going to need to take a sword. Now, does that mean that God's just completely not with you and God's not able to protect you? No, but he's given him this, this information because it's different now that he's gone. And he's saying, you need to just be prepared. You need to have, you know, you, you should have some money with you. You should have shoes. You should have a sword. And to the, the sword to the point of, hey, sell your garment. Make sure you got a sword. Make sure you got a way to protect yourself and defend yourself. This is a biblical teaching. This is what Jesus said after he was about to leave. He says, verse 37, For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. So obviously, we could see from that last uh, verse there, verse 38, when they said, we've got two swords, he's like, yeah, that's fine. That's enough. You don't need to go overboard with your, your prepping. Now look, I love guns. I love shooting them. And to me, it's, it's like a hobby. So like, like, I like to collect a lot. It's not because I'm thinking, oh, I need to have, you know, this whole arsenal to fight off the government at my door. You know, that's not going to happen. First of all, you know, this, this idea of like you being able to shoot your way out of the government, it's always going to fail because they have a never ending supply of resources to continue coming and continue coming. It's just, it's not going to work. So we need to be smart about it too. Think ahead about it. If, if that's what your, your plan is, that you say, well, I've got all these guns and ammo and food and I'm going to say, hold up in my house and, and you know, no. This, the result's going to be exactly the same. That's not a very wise tactical decision because you can look at events where this has already happened. You can look at Waco, Texas and see what happened there in the building that got demolished and, and set on fire with kids and women and, and men, you know, everyone in there burned alive at the hands of the government. Now, they had guns there. They could defend themselves for a little bit. But the same thing with Ruby Ridge. 
right? They had guns. They had, they had a stronghold or whatever. But when you're fighting against the government, you're not going to win. You can't just, just defend your house and, and take this position and think that the tanks and, and all the arsenal and everything that the government has, you're just going to be able to, to somehow, you know, be able to defeat them. It's not going to happen. Which is why you don't need to, to store up all, you know, stockpile all this weapons and everything else. But it's still wise to have, like you said, get a, get a sword. Get a way to defend yourself. But you don't need to, you don't need to stockpile everything and just, and just have this huge arsenal. Um, and, and that's why, and I, and I think we can see that balance. And we ought to keep that balance too as Christians. When you're thinking about how should I be preparing for end times, well, try to keep a good balance. You know, should we, you know, it's going to be perilous times. In the end times, it's perilous times. It's going to be more violence. You know, the Bible says, as the days of Noah were, and, and the days of Lot, so shall it be at the end of the world. In the days of Noah and in the days of Lot, we see great violence. Right before the flood, it was, it was said, you know, that that's why God destroyed the whole world is because people were being violent to each other and killing each other and doing all kinds of bad things. And in the same thing with Lot, you had the Sodomites surrounding the house and trying to force themselves on the people. And that was very perilous times as well. So we need to be able to defend ourselves in these perilous times. But again, we don't have to go overboard with it. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Because here's going to be another thing that we have to reconcile and make sure that we have the right outlook when we're considering how much should we be pre preparing and being ready for end times. And what is it really that God cares about and what should we be doing that would be considered biblical. Matthew 6 verse 19. Because we're told not to care about the treasures of this world. Matthew 6 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, This, obviously, these verses are completely true. But what I, I don't think this is referring to having extra food saved up in your, in your pantry for hard times that are to come. This is referring to your heart and what you're focused on. Now, if you're going to set all of your focus on just getting all of this food and laying that up for yourself, that's the wrong focus. But if you're focused on serving God and doing His will and focused on the things of heaven and then on the side, you know, just, just being, hey, I'm going to be wise about this and, and as we get a little bit extra money, I'm going to put my resources this way. Two different things. This is talking about where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I don't set up my heart on the oats or the rice that I might have, you know, like kind of put aside. That's not, that's not my treasure Right? That's not something, you know, this is referring to treasure. This is referring to being focused on money and how much you can gain and, and getting all the toys and the houses and the cars and the boats and, and all this other stuff. That's where your treasure is in because you cannot serve God and mammon, which is money. Being wise with the resources that you do have and, and being able to put things aside is not the same as just being all about these things being your treasures. And if it, if it is to that point where you're so into this stuff, that is your treasure, then you're not right with God. Because it shouldn't be. But um, we, what, what's interesting here, it says it uses the words laying up for yourself. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14, the Apostle Paul says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So here we see an example where Paul's saying, you know, it's not right. You, you know, as a child, you shouldn't be laying up for your ch for your parents. Laying up, being like laying up goods and 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 being able to provide for them and, and laying up this 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 big thing to give unto your parents. He's saying that the parents should be laying up for their children. The parents should be you know working and thinking ahead and trying to do their best to help their children out to lay up for them. And that's that's why the inheritance passes down you know, down from, from parents to child, obviously. Um, you're, you're doing what you can to help them, to propel them further, and to do more than what you've done in the past. That's the whole point of being able to lay up. But here we see saying that it is the parent's job to lay up for the children. It's their responsibility. So if, if putting things aside 
is somehow sinful, you say, no, that's not, that's not where my treasure is, but I'm going to do my best to try to make sure my children are as well prepared as possible. That's, that's a biblical concept, and I think it can be used the same way. Hey, if I'm responsible for feeding my children and feeding my family and providing for my family, if I know that there's going to be years ahead that are going to be really bad, then I'm not doing my job if I don't have a little bit of preparation saved up so that we can get through bad times. I mean, even if you just completely forget the fact that there is going to be an antichrist and that we're not going to be able to buy or sell, what if I were just to lose my job? What if I lost my job tomorrow? Am I going to be able to feed my family? What if I got injured or hurt and I'm not able to go back to work for a while? How am I going to be able to support my family? These are things that happen all the time. What if there's some natural disaster? You know, we get, we're, we're in a society today where we become so reliant on the grocery stores. And this is a relatively new phenomenon. All throughout history, it was not like this. But now we have these superstores and with technology and with transportation and with all these other resources that we have available to us today in modern society, we've gotten to the point to where most people don't have very much at home in ways of, in, in ways of food, medicine, all kinds of different things because as soon as you need something, you go, boom, I'm, all, I'm, I'm going over to 24-hour Walmart. I, I'm hungry. I want a midnight snack. I'll just go out to Taco Bell. I'll go whatever. I'll just get this food. It's already made and stuff. And then I'm taken care of. This is not the way things have been throughout almost all of history. People have always had to be prepared for times to come. People have always had to be able to lay up some kind of store and some kind of stock to say, well, we don't know what the future is going to bring. Maybe bad times are going to come. Let's be prepared for that. But we've gotten so used to this concept, and now even with the government. Oh, well, if I lose my job, I'll just go on welfare. I'll just get paid anyways. It's not a big deal. I have nothing to worry about. Nothing to be concerned about. Nothing to be wise about and think about the future. That's foolishness. I'll tell you what, that's foolishness. And it's, it's easy to get sucked into that type of thinking. And, and to a degree, look, we do it too. Okay? But if you are wise, you should just have these things in stock and, 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 and be prepared for bad times to come. And I believe even just knowing that there, are gonna be, there is going to be a tribulation coming, that it's wise to be prepared for that also. Um, you think about David, you know, prepared for the building of the temple for Solomon. He laid up all the resources that Solomon was going to need in order to, to help him in his task of building the temple. Turn if you would to Luke chapter 12. As I was preparing for the sermon and trying to think about different examples in the Bible, and even, even years ago when I was trying to consider what I should be doing as a Christian, if it's right, is, is, does it mean I have a lack of faith if, um, if I'm going and, and stocking up food or something? You know, does that mean that I don't trust that God's going to be able to take care of me? These are questions that went on in my mind years ago when I was trying to consider is it is it the right thing to do and during that time as well i think about this parable there's a parable in the bible in luke 12 that we're going to read that you might say can can apply to what i'm to what i'm talking about but um i don't think it actually does we'll, we'll see exactly what it says luke chapter 12 verse 15 it's a parable that jesus christ is teaching verse 15 luke 12 and he said unto them take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Now, this is going to be the key to the whole rest of this parable. Because he's talking about covetousness. He's talking about wanting things. You know, it's, it's the same thing that we were just talking about before, of laying that treasures for yourself up on earth. Because it, he's talking about the covetous attitude, just wanting more and more and wanting more stuff and, and, and laying up all these things for you to because, because you're greedy, because you're covetous, because you just want more and more and more. And because that's what you're living your life for is these things. And he's saying beware of covetousness because you know, your life isn't about the things that you have. And that's what I said. If, if you're prepping and like your whole life is about like, hey man, look at all this stuff I have. You're not right with God. But if you're doing it because you're trying to just be wise to be able to provide for yourself and for your family for hard times to come, there's nothing wrong with that. But let's read this parable. Uh, verse 16, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. 
And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And I want to point out that last phrase there, and is not rich toward God. He's saying, look, if you're laying up treasure for yourself and you're not rich towards God, you're a fool. You need to be rich towards God. Now, this is also a situation, this guy was already rich, and he's, he's already full, he's got all this stored, already stocked up, and then he just builds up more so that he doesn't have to do anything. He basically just be like, I'm going to retire, I'm not going to do anything else, I'm not going to do any work, and I'm just going to have all of this stuff, right? And I'm just going to eat off of it and not do anything. Well, I'm not advocating that either when, you, when you're getting prepared for times to come, I'm still talking about working, and obviously the focus is still being rich toward God. That is the primary thing. So if you're worried about you know, these times to come, for the first and foremost thing that you need to get down is your walk with God and being righteous, getting sin out of your life, doing soul winning, coming to church, doing all these things are way, 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 they're going to be way more important for you than any amount of food that you can get stocked up for yourself. So put the priority in the right place. Because that is way more important for you. Because I'll tell you this, God is able to see you through any times, no matter what. That is a truth. No matter what times are to come, God is capable of keeping you and making you survive, as he did with um, Elijah. When Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three years, it didn't rain. But what happened? God took care of him. God brought him to a brook, and he was by this brook for a while until the waters dried up. And then he brought him to the woman that, that he miraculously, that just had food, you know, out of the barrel. Um, just continued to just never, it never wasted because God was taking care of him. God had the ravens bringing him food. Literally. I mean, this just, God had, it's completely miraculous, and God was able to sustain him. Because God wasn't finished with him in the work that he was doing. But Elijah was a very righteous man of God also. He was somebody that had favor with God because he was doing God's will and he was a preacher of the word and he was doing what is right. That's why I'm saying, hey, focus on being righteous and doing good. Way, way more important than just laying up this food for you. But laying up the food is a wise thing to do also. Okay, but we, don't, we just want to make sure we have our priorities right and our focus in the right place. Verse 22 of Luke 12 says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. And see, this is the part where you have to reconcile. He's saying, he was trying to teach this concept, saying, Look, you don't have to worry about what you're doing. You have to worry about these things. Because God's going to take care of you. And this is absolutely true. We need to, to not be so concerned about it but it's still a wise thing to be ready for the future. You know, it, it, it's the same concept. That's why Jesus said, you know, hey, make sure you got a sword. You take your purse. Take these things with you. You could say, yeah, but God, you know, I don't have to worry about anything because God's with me. Yeah, but it's still, it's still a good thing to take these things with you. God is capable of doing all these things, but it's still a wise thing to, to take it with you. Now, and what he's saying here also is that that shouldn't be your, you know, like, like I said, that's not your main priority and focus is, oh man, what are we going to do tomorrow? Oh man, what, you know, God will take care of us. You can rest faithfully in him while at the same time doing what you can to do what's right. It's a, you know, I'm fully confident that God will take care of my financial needs no matter what, but it doesn't mean that I stop going to work as a result. Right? It doesn't mean I just sit on the couch then every day and don't have to, and don't, and don't have to, to do anything to provide for my family. God will take care of me. I know that. There's no doubt about that. God will provide the clothing that we need and the food to put on the table, but I'm still going to work. You see what I mean? That's the, that's the attitude. Now, now jump down to verse 32. Verse 32, he says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, nor neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, 
there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And be ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the son of man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now, I believe he's primarily talking here about being spiritually ready, being ready for the return of, of, of Jesus Christ, that we need to be ready, we need to know he's coming back, but the concept can still be applied to knowing, he's saying, look, if you would have known when the thief is going to come, you'd be waiting at your door with a shotgun, waiting at the window, ready for that guy, right? You're not going to let yourself be, be taken over and be robbed. You'd be ready for it. Well, he's saying here, be, you, you also be ready because the Son of Man is going to come. Hey, and we know that when he comes, there's going to be a lot of bad times before that. We should be ready for that. I think of, um, I'm going to turn, turn if you go to Hebrews 11. I need to find the verse for this. Because the concept of saying, you know, as I alluded to earlier, this idea that, well, maybe I don't have very much faith if I'm, if I'm preparing all this food and stuff and trying to get ready for hard times to come. Does that mean I don't have faith? Well, no, I think it's just the opposite. We see Noah, Noah was the ultimate doomsday prepper, right? But of course, with Noah, he was following God's specific commands to build the ark. And in Hebrews 11, Verse number seven, the Bible reads, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So this is saying that actually the reason why Noah built the ark is because of his faith. And I think that if you get some food prepared and just be ready, like, like I'm doing, like, you know, obviously you, you have whatever resources you have. You know, my resources are very, very limited, so it's not like we have very much anyways. But um, whatever you do do or decide to do, to me, it's, it's because, like for me, it's because of my faith. It's because I know there is a tribulation period to come. I know that. It's not seen, just as with Noah, it wasn't seen. He, they, didn't, they hadn't even seen rain before. You know, God opened up the, the earth and there had been floods and, and, um, and rain down out of heaven for four days and four nights when he brought the flood on the earth. And Noah needs to, to build a boat. Why? Because he believed that it was going to happen. He believed God's word. He believed it to be true. And the wise thing for Noah to do is to listen to God to be able to, to get through those hard times, to get through that coming judgment that was coming in his days. He prepared that ark because he had faith. Even if other people make fun of them. Hey, people might make fun of you and say, oh yeah, nothing's going to happen. You know, as it was in the days of our father, so shall it be, you know, in the days to come that, that nothing's, uh, the world is going to keep on going the way it is. You know, Jesus hasn't come back. It's been over 2,000 years now. What do you, you know, you're crazy, whatever. No, by faith, I know that these things are coming. I know that it's going to happen and I'm going to be ready for that. I, first and foremost, I am going to be ready spiritually. I am going to be ready so that nobody can shake my faith, that I don't care what lying signs and wonders are out there. I am going to stand firm. No one's going to push me down. I'm going to stand firm for the cause of Christ. But secondarily, I'm going to make sure also that I'm ready because I know that there's going to be bad times to come. And I want to be able to keep my family and my church and everybody else, anybody that I could possibly help out during those times who maybe didn't get as well prepared to help them out also. And I think that's a good thing to do. <clears throat> Let's go back to Genesis 41. I'm going to wrap up this chapter here. I think uh, we're kind of running out of time. Genesis 41. So I don't think it's a sin to be preparing for bad times as far as, you know, having a weapon, a way to defend yourself, and having some food. 
and you know maybe a way to barter with people. I, like, we see we see that these events are going to happen. Now, should that be your primary focus on life? Absolutely not. Your primary focus should be on on serving God and doing what being rich towards God. And if you lay up some other things for your help, and hey, you know what? What's wrong with having a little bit of food laid up and then someone else has a need, someone else in the church or someone else, you know, someone you know has this need and they need, you know, they lose a job. He that hath, you know, I mean, be, give unto them. You've got this extra stuff. It's not going to impact you know, your flight. Hey, use it now. Great. Amen. And there's nothing wrong with being able to do that too. And it puts you in a position to be able to help other people out also. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong or sinful with doing any of that stuff. Genesis 41. Let's wrap things up here. So Pharaoh gives his ring unto Joseph. He gives all the power into his hand. And uh, I like verse 44. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. He's like, no one's going to do anything unless they go to you first. He's like, like you are the be all end all for everything. He said, there's going to be no work done. Nothing's going to happen without your approval. Verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphnath Paneum. So he gives him a new name, an Egyptian name. And he gave him to wife Azanath, the daughter of Potiphera. Now this isn't Potiphar, you know, who was the captain of the guard. Potiphar, it's a very similar name, but he was a priest, um, I guess, and, and that's who was given Joseph as a wife. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Verse 46. Interesting, you know, we've been looking at, and I don't want to get too much in depth in this now because we're running out of time, but we see a lot of parallels or foreshadowing of Jesus Christ within the life of Joseph. And we've seen that in the, in the other chapters. We're going to see a little bit more in the, in the chapters to come. But verse 46 says, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This is the same exact age that Jesus Christ was when he began his ministry. Right? So Joseph is elevated to this position, and now he's really come into authority and a place of power and a place to do good works and do good things at the age of 30 years old. And he's really starting, if you will, his ministry and his, and his work right in Egypt. It's the same age that Jesus Christ came and he started his ministry. Um, just, just a little bit of, uh, more of the, the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ there through Joseph. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities, um, the food of the field, which was round about every city, laid he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. He, he had accumulated so much food, he couldn't even keep track of it anymore. They were bringing in so much. And he's plenty of years, he's saying it's without number. They couldn't even keep tally of how much food they had, which was great. That, that shows how prepared they were, because the seven years are going to be extreme famine. And we see there's going to be people coming from all other lands also in order to get food. It didn't just affect Egypt. It affected people all around the area that were coming to get food. So they had food in abundance and then some, not just for their own people, but also to help out the other people from other countries round about. And then it says, um, verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asnath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of An, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So Joseph finally gets to a place where with his firstborn son, he, he's, he's very thankful and he's glad. And, and, and the name of his firstborn son reflects that, where it says that he was able to forget. Like now he's gotten to a point, all the hardship and the bad things he's had to deal with in his life, he doesn't think about those things anymore. And even his father's house. He says, I don't think about that stuff. It bothered him for a long time, obviously, as it should. You know, it, it, it makes sense. It's going to bother you. Your, your, your own brethren turn against you and they, you know, they sell you into slavery and you have all these bad things happen. God can turn things around. And we need to remember, no matter where you are in your life right now, of course, it's always the worst when you're going through it right now. Right in the now. You're in this real bad place. God can bring you through. You know, stay with it. Don't let that get you down and out and quit. Stay with, stay with doing what's right. Stay with God. He'll see you through and He could bring you to the place where you don't even think about that anymore. It's real difficult in the moment. I know that. 
But we need to be able to look at these stories to gain to gain some extra, you know, look at the story of Job and some other people have gone through some extreme hardships to see that there is an end and there is an end that, that can be very good for you and very blessed by you, but you have to make through the difficult times. And then verse 52, in the name of the second, <coughs> called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And that's interesting too that the name he gives his second born Ephraim means it has the meaning of God's caused Joseph to be fruitful in the land of his affliction. And of course, Ephraim is the one that was blessed above Manasseh. And Ephraim is the tribe that grew to be extremely fruitful. And they were, they were the largest tribe. They grew to be very big. And that was, you know, part of his name. I thought that's kind of interesting also. Verse 53, we'll finish up here. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. So you know, Pharaoh still is just he's diverting everything to Joseph, saying, Okay, Joseph's the man, he's in charge. Let him, you know, just go to him. And whatever he says to do, that's what we're going to do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. Now, I'm going to go into this much more. I think it's chapter 47. But does it seem right? Now, and this is why I think Joseph is doing something that's wrong. He taxed the land for the first seven years and took 20% of what they made in order to be able to provide for them when the famine came. But... They, if, if they are, it already belonged to them because they, they are the ones that cultivated crops and they just took it through taxation. Now he's selling it unto them. That's not right. It belonged to them before. He was just holding it up and, and storing it in place to keep it for the time when they're going to need it. It's like, you know, right now the government takes Social Security out of your check, right? To, to, to give you a retirement so that the government doesn't have to take care of you later. It's supposed to be your money, right, that they're putting aside for you. But then to turn around and be like, okay, well now we're going to tax you on this again when they give it back to you. That's like what Joseph's doing here. Right. It's like, you already took it from me and now you're going to take it from me again as it's, you know, it's supposed to be mine. Well, this food was theirs and now he's taxing it again and he's charging them money to receive their own food that, that he had taken from them. That's not right, but we're, we're going to get into how that brings them into bondage and, and the way too much power gets, gets put in Pharaoh's realm and, and the whole land. I mean, it, this, is, this is a big deal. I'm going to go into a lot in that chapter because there's, that, that is in and of itself is a huge concept for people who control food have so much power. And this is something that's, that's coming up, I believe, also in our days with people trying to control our food and, um, and have the you know, trying to eliminate people from growing their own crops and everything else because if you control food, man, you control the people. You have to eat. Right. Everybody has to eat, no matter what. And, and there's a lot of power that lies in that. But we'll get into that in the future. We've, we've already exhausted this chapter, I think, well enough. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for your words of wisdom, dear God, for this... Um, the dream that, that you had given unto Pharaoh and the warning of the, of the troublous times to come and the wisdom that Joseph gave to be prepared for that. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to maintain a proper balance in our lives of being wise about the future, being wise about knowing and believing and having full faith in what you've told us is to come, that we can see from your Holy Scripture that, that hard times are to come, dear Lord, and that we can be prepared for those times, first and foremost, spiritually and mentally, dear Lord, that, that we wouldn't be wavering in our faith at all, but that we would be strong and that we would do great works for your name, dear Lord, but also that we can just have some, some wisdom to be able to provide for our families and to be able to have in store to, against these times that are, that are to come and face us, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to maintain that balance and that we would not think about these things as, as laying up our treasures on earth, dear Lord, but that we would stay committed and focused to serving you, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.